meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. First order of business is to comment and approve the minutes of the December 19th, the year 2000 meeting. Any comments or motions from the board members? It has been moved to accept. Do I hear a second? Second. One second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. I have a lengthy list of correspondence received in our packet at our homes and also some correspondence that was given to us this evening on the podium. I'll list through them. Uh, there's approximately 15 pieces involving the Irving Station uh, over on Shore Road. A letter from Mr. and Mrs. Houghton. A letter from E. Krishnitsky. A letter from M. Barron, a letter from M. Ellis, a letter from J. J. DiMucci, a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Cahill, a letter from S. Higgins, a letter from J. Cutler, a letter from J. Lassad, a letter from B. Kurtz, a letter from J. Duro, a letter from D. Churchill, a letter from N. Sears, a letter from J. McWright, a letter from N. Finneran, and a letter from S. Monaghan. In regards to <coughs> Any proposed development on the Irvy Station site uh, should be noted that the uh, Planning Board does not have an application before it at this time for any proposed development on that site. We've also received from the Town Plan and the Zoning News December 2000 and the Planning Commissioner's Journal Winter 2001. In addition, on the podium this evening, we have a comment concerning one of the items on the agenda this evening, proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance that would reduce the minimum lot size for non-conforming lots from 20,000 to 10,000 square feet. From John Burns, a letter from Space, Saving Protected Areas in Cape Elizabeth concerning the zoning amendment. A letter from Kenneth Rogers concerning the zoning amendment. A letter from Mary Allen and David Whiteman concerning the zoning amendment. Any comments from planning board members concerning the correspondence we served, received this week? Hearing none, the first order of business on the planning board's agenda this evening is the election of officers. The planning board is required to annually elect chair and vice chair members from the board. Uh, at workshop, we had a preliminary discussion in regards to this. I'd ask at this time for the board members to make their nominations and seconds at this time for a chair and vice chair. You can do it in one motion if you like. Yes, Karen. Hi. I'd like to make a nomination. I'd like to nominate as chair of the planning board, David Griffin, and as co-chair, or sorry, what's the proper, vice chair, John Seraldo. Any other nominations from the board? Is there a second? Second. second? second. Any further comments? Hearing none, those in favor of the nomination, please raise your right hand. Mr. Griffin, we're about to change seats. business tonight, uh, the start. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's nice of you to do that. First order of business tonight is the uh, Strout Tower site plan, if you'd uh, come forward and bring us up to date. My name is uh, Paul Strout, and I'm here representing Herbert Strout, who's my dad, and uh, 
he's coming before the town because he'd like to put a telecommunications tower on his property. Um, I'll explain to you where that property is. We've got a charge. really isn't that big. I thought it was bigger. Uh, his site, his property is across from the Prakutic Club. Uh, it's between, it's before you get to Wells Road by quite a distance. But if you, part of his property, you look right across Spurlink Avenue and, and you'll see the golf course. And if you know the terrain <clears throat> from there, it goes up over a hill. His property is still on the right. It goes back down over another hill. His property is still on the right. And as you go up over the next hill, you'll see the last of his property. Uh, he, he has a 30-acre parcel, so it's a sizable parcel. And he feels, as well as we do, that <coughs> It's an excellent spot for a tower in Cape Elizabeth. Dad started out in the, the 30s and 40s with crystal radios, and he's followed it all the way up through. He's Justin, my son, who's here, is the fifth generation in Cape Elizabeth. The, the, th the point that I want to make to you is that Dad has been in this business a long while, he started his business in Cape Elizabeth, 1946, which was community radio. In 1953, he moved to this parcel that I've described to you, and he put up his first telecommunications tower. That was way before they had any ordinances. <clears throat> in 1989, Cellular came to Cape Elizabeth, and they positioned their tower on his property. And what has happened is that tower now has a total of four carriers, and the tower is overloaded. I'm sure you people are aware of the 1996 Telecommunications Act that, that asks tower owners to build a tower that's strong enough to have other carriers co-locate. <clears throat> and that first tower has reached its maximum of co-locators. Now it's time for Dad to put up a tower, which will also be a very strong tower that can take co-locators. Now, the existing tower is on a 100 by 100 plot. It's a, it's a freestanding tower, which means that it has no guy cables. It's, it's pretty massive. It's 19 foot at the base and about 7 foot at the, the top. The tower that uh, Dad is proposing is 4 foot constant cross section, which, which is quite a bit smaller. And the way we we're able to accomplish that is by putting guy wires on that tower. And what we've done is we've positioned, we've positioned the tower 
This, this is the original self-supporting tower. We've positioned his tower as close as we could to that. And the reason is, is you have a buffering effect so that anyone viewing it from over here probably would never see Dad's tower. They'd be just looking at the original tower. The other reason was that with its location being close, you don't have to cut any more additional trees in this direction. You have to cut a few over this way and this way and enough to access a 20 by 12 building that we're proposing. <clears throat> the uh, the existing road coming in, the only thing that will change on that existing road is that we're going to cut an 80-foot road in to access this tower and put a culvert in. And that's <clears throat> the way that we're going to accomplish that is all drawn so that erosion will not be a problem. We, uh, we're here before you tonight in hopes that you agree with us that his site is an excellent site. You, in uh, April 15, 2000, considered all of his property a tower overlay district. And we think that it'd be prudent to uh, allow him to put that tower on his property. Now, I can address the uh, submission and the performance standards all 25 of them one by one if you want, or I could, I could just answer questions that anyone would have on any of those items. Your choice. I would recommend uh, that we address the completeness first. Out in regards to completeness, I'm assuming you have a letter for most associates, the town engineer. I have copied that. Uh, <coughs> numbers six, seven, and eight are just minor housekeeping recommendations in regards to your application submittal. Do you have any objections to those whatsoever? Let me see what we're talking about. Be on the final page of Mr. Harding's letter. Six, seven, and eight of uh, yes, sir. proposed building structures, roads, driveways, parking. Are we talking about their, Excuse me. their letter? Their letter, page three of their letter. The package that you received from me, yeah. Paul, the last page. Okay, about their preliminary design information mm -hmm. submitted on the tower. It's basically yeah. just recommendations he has for the applicant in regards to obtaining the final building permit. Yeah, I, uh, he has no objections whatsoever to completeness. Right. I, the way I handle this is I gave, I gave the board a quote that I got from a tower company, which is not the document that I would give you if we were to put the tower in. What happens is if you order a tower, then they'll provide all of the engineering for the same cost as the tower. If you ask for it up front, it's two, three thousand dollars. So it didn't seem prudent without uh, a permit to have that engineering done. Once I get the permit, then we'll provide all the engineering information for you. And that's pretty standard procedure. Thank you.
Based on the information we received at workshop and also the comments from the town engineer, uh, as one member, I have no objections to considering this application complete. Any other comments? I have just one one question about the lighting. There was some question at the workshop as far as the uh, foot candles and whatnot. Have you come to a conclusion as to what you're going to do there? Yeah. Uh, what I did is I got the information that you'd require. The only lighting is outside of the building door. It's going to be a, a 90 watt light bulb. They call it a flood. It's going to be they have 1,200 lumens in a 30-degree radius. And I think that, that answers all the questions they had. But in a practical point, this tower's out behind Dad's barn. You know, it's a 90-watt light bulb that nobody's ever going to see. And the only time it comes on is it's got a motion detector. If you come up to the building so that you can open the door, that's, that's its only function. So it will it won't be on unless there's somebody close by. Yes, yeah, it's got a motion detector on. And it's a it's just a typical floodlight. I mean it's the kind that you buy at the hardware store and, and screw in. Does the tower have to have any lighting on top? No. It's not required. And the way you can assure yourself that it doesn't is there's an existing 180 foot tower that does not have to be doesn't there. require typically a tower under 200 feet doesn't have to be there mr chair i'd like to offer a motion uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented that the application of Herb and Doris Strout to construct a new 180 foot tall telecommunications tower to be located at 14 Strout Road be deemed complete. Any comments before we take a vote? I'd like to second that, David. Motion has been seconded. And Please take a vote. All those in favor, show by raising right hand. It's a unanimous vote. You will proceed. I'd like to throw out a question to the board at this point as to whether uh, it's important to you before we have the next meeting with this subject uh, whether we have a site walk or not. Is it anybody interested in uh, seeing the site before they look at the final plan? I, given the information that we've already seen and fact that this area is approved for a tower, I guess I would see any reason. So I guess at this point the planning board has decided that they're not interested, not needing to make a site walk, so at this point uh, you could proceed with your plans. I didn't hear your question. I, I just said that I guess we will not need a site walk, so you can proceed with your procedure to bring it forward to our next meeting okay. and deal with the green. Okay. If you have any questions, we've got three generations of knowledge here, so. All right. I guess there's one other issue that we have to deal with before this is finished tonight, and that is to decide whether we need a public hearing relative to this issue. So I throw it out to the board at this time for discussion. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to ask Mr. Stroud a few questions while he's still with us. Okay. If that's all right. Would you mind answering a couple more questions, sir? Sorry, you almost, almost snuck away. I don't know your procedure. That's all right. Neither do I. 
learning it. Uh, the, the proposed new tower is the same height above ground as the existing self-supporting tower? within, say, 10 or 15 feet. Sure. Yes. Um, well, that was my question. Is the tower itself the same height and the difference in elevation is because the, the, the bases are at different elevations above sea level? That's right. So the new one will be 10 to 15 feet higher visually than the current tower? That's right. Okay. Bear with me for a moment. I've got sure. just a couple of others. Uh, I noticed in the application materials that the tower itself would be constructed of galvanized steel, mm -hmm. which is a in my view anyway, a pretty good color to fade into the, into the sky on most days. How about the cable bundles that run up the tower? I think in the workshop you had mentioned that uh, those are typically black, which stand out a lot more prominently to the viewer, but uh, there I is the option. I agree with you, and I mean, we're open to suggestions. If, if you feel that, uh, you know, painting those the same color as the structural steel, then any of these providers coming along, that would be one of our requirements for them co-locating on our site. So, you know, if, if you come to a conclusion that that's more appropriate, we, we'd gladly do that. So that could, I, I have to defer to the town planner. Is that something we could stipulate in, a, in an ultimate approval? Yes. Okay. Could you, uh, Help me understand a little bit, what services do you anticipate the new tower uh, providing an access point for, given that there are already four carriers on the existing tower? So there's a guy right here that could probably answer a lot of questions when it comes to that. It's Peter Cook, who's represented most of the carriers that are on the existing tower. Immediately, he has a need for a Sprint who wants to come along. They're a PCS carrier, and we anticipate many more to follow. It's, uh, with the new technologies, you just don't know. They have uh, the new microwave that you don't need to have a license for. There's, uh, you know, Peter, you probably got more ideas than I what comes down the road. Uh, sure, Peter Cook. Uh, just a, would you send a... Caught me all off guard now. It's just relaxing back there. Um, my name is Peter Cook. I'm with uh, Company Hall Wellman Associates. So we do work on behalf of Sprint PCS and the siting for Sprint PCS. Uh, we're currently working, uh, they have service now which reaches uh, in Maine from Kittery up through the Portland area, and we are in the process of adding about 20 new sites uh, which will push us uh, into additional coverage areas like Cape Elizabeth as well as strengthening some of the coverage areas that we have. Uh, we do have uh, a, what we call a, a ring uh, of uh, an area that we need coverage. Uh, we're evaluating this site as well as the, uh, the town home site at the, um, at the um, DPW garage is a couple of the options that are obviously available to us under the bylaw. And uh, we, uh, we have you know, get to, to strike our deal, but are, are hopeful that uh, whether it be fall, that we will be back uh, at some point needing, uh, needing to strike, uh, uh, strike a spot. With regard to additional people coming down the pipe, there are all kinds of uh, different uh, licenses that are, that are um, and services that are out there. Uh, you're starting to see in the Boston area uh, the uh, wireless internet uh, service providers. Uh, something called Metricom is putting in five to 600 sites in the, in the Boston area for wireless internet access. Uh, you're starting to see third generation uh, video um, capacities uh, in both the PCS and cellular carriers. And you've actually just recently had additional PCS licenses. So there was an auction that just closed um, a couple of weeks ago that the F, uh, FCC uh, uh, put out additional spectrum in uh, really York County through up, uh, up to the Bangor area. So it is constantly changing, and you will have, I'm sure, other people knocking on your door. Sprint, uh, I hope, will be the, will be the, will be the next. So this would make Sprint the fifth cellular yes, right operating? Yes, right now on the existing, uh, the existing tower that's there uh, is owned by Crown Castle. You have uh, Verizon uh, Wireless is there. You have AT&T Wireless is there. You have uh, OmniPoint, uh, now VoiceStream, and you have Nextel. 
Uh, Sprint is, off, is, is um, licensed for PCS. Uh, AT&T actually bought Vanguard Cellular, which was Cellular One, which, was a, which is a cellular carrier. Um, AT&T also owns a PCS license for New England. Uh, as an example, in, in the Massachusetts market <coughs> in New Hampshire, AT&T actually built out their PCS license. That they're not a cellular carrier. So they do have a, another license there. Uh, I've been told, uh, I can think of at least two other PCS licenses that are out in this market. I'm not sure in terms of time frame, in terms of build out, but uh, Singular, uh, which was the old, um, in, in the Boston area, was Cell One in the Boston area, Southwestern Bell, SBC Communications just bought a number of licenses in New Hampshire and, and Maine. Um, nothing on the, on the immediate horizon, but uh, I'm sure you know, their, their plans are to, to take advantage of their, of their... So can a market this size really support five cellular carriers in a town like Cape Elizabeth? Well, I think, frankly, a lot of it's going to depend on um, uh, where the technology goes and the types of things that are, that are coming behind it. Is there, is there enough of a market for car phones? Absolutely not. Is there enough of a market for um, you know, one phone wherever you go? I mean, that's most of these carriers are looking to compete with your, with your local uh, plan, uh, with your local cable company in terms of the types of things that they're bringing. And uh, the wireless technology, um, frankly, in Europe, they're already in third generation. Um, Voice Stream is a client of ours that's being bought by Deutsche Telekom. Voice Stream nationwide has probably nine or 10,000 sites. Uh, Deutsche Telekom alone in Germany has 25,000 sites. And not just tower sites, but they have, you have service when you're down on the, on the, on the subway platform below ground, in the tunnels, uh, anywhere you go there is, there is service. And they are not only doing phone service, but it's internet access, it's uh, wireless email, it's uh, video uh, conferencing, uh, uh, video <coughs> throughput of movies, all sorts of, of, of other things that are there. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of people spending a lot more money than, than, than I know in terms of who's going to end up with with uh, with service. But certainly the players that are left, there's been a tremendous amount of consolidation of of, of markets uh, where the the main cellulars of the world have given way to the AT&Ts of the world that have you know the billions of dollars it needs to create a national and, and frankly international market for this stuff. But you're going to see. Sprint obviously is sizable, AT&T is sizable, Deutsche Telecom, which is now in the process of buying voice stream is, is sizable. So you've got some, you've got a lot of heavyweights that are out there that are, that are betting a lot of money that, that there's enough, there's enough market for everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. two, two other quick questions. Uh, Mr. Strott mentioned something about unlicensed bands. Is there anticipated use of ISM or spread spectrum applications on this tower? That would really be up to Mr. Uh, Mr. Stroud in terms of what, what goes on in tower. Each one of the carriers own a particular license for their band, and uh, there are some carrier. There are some up in the 2.4 gigahertz that are mm -hmm. not licensed for science. I know there's a carrier, and I'm not sure if he's had, had any conversation, but I know there's a fellow who's deploying some equipment in the Portland area for wireless <laughs> internet uh, that is using that unlicensed 2.4 okay. gig. So it's sort of fine. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Thank you. May I ask Mr. Strout one more question, and then I promise I'll I quiet down. Go ahead. Good evening. Good I'm evening, sir. The old man, Herb. And uh, I'd like to address the unlicensed thing. We've been uh, approached by several of the, uh, some of them are licensed and some are not, but they have a system a wide band where you can put pictures, anything. Like, let's take, for an instance, schools. If uh, Cape Elizabeth wanted to inter integrate a system with other schools around, they could just talk to each other as if they were in the same room through this system. Pictures, anything that needs to be done. Email, the whole thing. And all it takes is the height in order to allow it to work. Back last year, uh, I believe this town was uh, approached with some kind of an idea like that. 
but it was going to be done by cable. Well, that's a situation where uh, I guess it could be quite costly. This other system does not have to be costly. It can be a setup where it's used like your uh, television channel is, when it's convenient, when you have something important enough you want to uh, integrate uh, with another school or something with the university or something like that. It's, it's there, and ready to go at an instant. And perhaps medical would be another thing could be done. Right now, the rescue wagon leaves here. They're in communication. And they do have a, a means of sending data back and forth. But with this setup, it could be even more precise. It's in its embryonic state at the moment. So that's, I can add that. That's about it. Do you have any other questions? Yes, sir, one more. Uh, I promise, just one more. The, uh, the current tower has four alternate tower structures attached to it. And uh, you identified who the carriers are who, are who have antennas on those structures. Can you help me understand what, what's the percent utilization of those? Are all four of those actively used on a daily basis? Is the ones which exist now on the original tower? Yes, sir. Oh, Pete can do much better with that. I can. <laughs> because here's the difference. I leased the land to that entity and they have uh, arranged to put what they will on it, and I have no control over it. This is why we want to do this one. So we have the mm. control. We know who is here. We will be more responsive to the town for that reason. Peter? Yeah. Pick it up on you. Um, they are, every one, every carry that's on there, is, that is part of their network for forming all our active and, and on air have either of their services right now that's where you're you're pulling your your, uh, your service off of right now um, the in essence uh, for those particular carriers um, you for, for interference frequency interference issues you do have a certain amount of separation you need to maintain between them and that's generally about 10 feet from from one to the next you'll notice that each each uh, carrier that's up there <clears throat> has almost a triangular pod, and they've got antennas with what they call them pointing at three different azimuths. And if you look at their at their um, layout for their network uh, from a bird's eye view, it would almost look like a three-leaf clover in terms of the type of coverage that they would put. Those are all directional antennas, as opposed to their to a whip-style antenna, which is a very you know just a circular type type pattern. And it's kind of pushes out a, a, a bigger signal because of the interactive portion of, of, of their business with the send and receives they um, and the type of features the digital types of features that they're looking for they use more of a directional antenna so basically RF design for any of them is to kind of interlock those those three leaf glowers from site to site so that you have a slight bit of overlap so that you move from one cell to the next, that you have a handoff, a smooth handoff from one to the other. And each one of those, when you buy a frequency, when you buy a, a license, you, you buy a, a certain band of frequencies. And each one of those sites uh, reuses one of those frequencies. And really the old RF design is to try to pull those together right. in an overlap. Uh, so, um, as I say, you would, you would typically have Two issues. One is that you need a uh, certain amount of separation between uh, each carrier uh, for, for their um, uh, to allow them not to interfere with each other, and that also adds uh, obviously available heights. So that 180 foot tower, uh, the, the really the available height there, once you go 180, 170, 160, 150, is probably around the 140, 130 level. And you may not get the kind of push out of there that, that you need to be able to cover the town. So a sprint, um, our interest uh, would probably be something in the 160 to 170 level to get us to link back to our site. Just about everybody who's on that tower is also on the tower in South Portland, the, uh, the very controversial tower a couple of years ago in South Portland. That's pretty much how they all link back to, mm -hmm. to and, and tie you into that network. And the, and the big issue really is to get over the ridge that separates South Portland from, from Cape Elizabeth and being high enough to, to make that connection. Okay. The PCS guys are all on very high frequency, very low power. So it's, it's, they might get 
two to two and a half mile uh, radius out of a, a, a tower site like that, the cellular carriers would get a little bit more push because they're a lower frequency and a little, little bit more. Um, and the other issue that you run into on a tower development is is a structural capacity issue because you you have wind loads that are associated not only with the antennas, which are the obvious thing, but frankly the, the cable uh, running up inside the tower, you're, you're creating a solid face there. So that, that is the tower. Um, if you recall from, or you may not if you weren't here at the time, but I know Nextel, who was the last carrier through, needed to do some structural upgrades to be able to accommodate their, uh, accommodate their use. Yeah, the, the uh, application points out that the tower is at its, its physical maximum for carrying any more antenna structures. Um, what my question was trying to discern is, are all the antennas that are up there fully utilized? And I think your answer was yes. That I think that each of those four not, it, it, When they have done it, they have uh, carriers release a certain amount. You know, they may only put up nine of the 12 antennas, depending on on call volume and capacity as they add additional uh, uh, customers. Right. They would do that. So the structural analysis that have done there is done on what everyone what everyone has leased in terms of potential for, for those antennas. Now, I'm not sure how that relates back to the permitting sides of things, because I know um, the antennas, you know, are, are some, some of your prior decisions limit the number of antennas, so some people may need to come back and ask for permission again at that point. But, uh, but by and large, uh, you know, a lot will depend on what the next guy, you know, what the next guy wants to do. Uh, and I'm not, I don't think it really reviewed the, the structural capacity, so I really can't comment as to whether that's fine. the capacity, but, but certainly uh, um, each carrier would do their own analysis. And I, as I say, I do know that Nextel didn't even upgrade the last time they were there. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. I have a, a question for the applicant also, and that whichever one of you uh, could, could help me out a little bit. I do a lot of work here, but I'm laying out well, the, the tower is 180 feet high, and the highest uh, antenna cluster is at elevation 165. Is, is that something uh, that is part of uh, the way towers are built, or is there, a, or is there in, in fact, the ability to come back at some point in the future and put a tower at 175 I guess on a 180 yeah. tower? Or, uh, <laughs> How, how does I notice because you're, you're calling out four carriers, and I would imagine you know, that height is obviously something that is a benefit. Our reasoning in, in having the tower constructed this way is that the new technologies that Dad's talking about, they would be the ones that would be the highest elevation. And that's the reason that we're from, we showed the first antenna at 165, I believe. And you know. we're proposing that these... Uh, microwave antennas go from 165 to the top. Oh, okay. Are, the, are these uh, different types other than those big triangular arrays, more like individual dishes, or, or just the, the you microwave, figure out what they are? The individual dishes, and they're small ones. Typically, okay. they're two foot or smaller in diameter. Okay. And you can put a lot of them in that space, and that's our idea. I see. Okay, thank you. Hey, Mr. Str Mr. Stroud, I have two questions I'd like to ask you before you. Um, you made reference to a 20 by 12 building. Mm -hmm. Just a comment. On your plans, it shows a 30 by 20 equipment shelter. Is that what you were talking about? I, what that was for, I, I didn't realize that I'd done that. I, okay. You certainly brought it to me. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that's, that's the type of building. You might want to check it. Um, just a curiosity, how long do you consider the life of a tower? Well, it's hard saying. Like, I've been putting towers up for 35 years. Some of the towers that I put up, I still maintain. I know of uh, other towers that have been up for well over 50 years. They're, they're galvanized inside and out, so they're pretty nearly indestructible. As a matter of fact, better than that, the tower we're putting up is all solid rod, so there is no inside. It's, you know, completely solid, which is, you know, the best corrosion protection you can get. Thank you. Any other questions? We have 
two issues to deal with here. Um, we've got to order here to consider whether we want to have a public hearing or not. Is there anybody that feels as though that should be? Maureen, could, in order to help me make my decision, could you review what sort of notifications will be provided to the abutters now that the application is complete and on what schedule and when they could respond in writing, et cetera, et cetera? Um, what we did when this was first put on a workshop agenda is we mailed the notice to everyone within 500 feet or the nearest 25 property owners. Uh, those same people received this, the, a notice for tonight's meeting and we would mail them a third notice. Um, we are required to mail it a week before the planning board meeting. We usually get it 10 days out 10 days before the meeting so that they get it a week before the meeting and would have an opportunity um, to come to the meeting or at any time that you could have received letters for tonight's meeting if there were people so inclined to write to you. And to date you've received no correspondence from any of those people? No, I, I'm trying to remember if I've, if I've gotten a phone call. I, my sense is that there's, there's maybe one or two people, especially in that neighborhood, who might like the opportunity, but I don't know whether they would exercise it to, to speak to the board about this. I haven't gotten any strong call saying they were in strongly in support or against this project. further thoughts on Mr. Chair last time uh, the planning board had a discussion on cellular towers in the town of Cape Elizabeth there was an overwhelming amount of interest on the part of the public and I while that may at that time have had something to do with the proposed locations of the of the other tower overlay district that was contemplated at that time uh, I, uh, I would think that uh, perhaps that same level of interest is still there and it would be, it would be a good idea to just uh, see if it really is and give folks a chance to come in and educate us. Any other thoughts in that vein? Somebody like to make a motion? Mr. Griffin, I'll make a motion. Be it further ordered that the application be tabled to the regular March 20th, 2001 planning board meeting, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Mr. Carter's made a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Any uh, discussion regarding the motion? And, uh, should we take a vote? All those in favor? Shall be raising right hand. Any opposed? We will have a notice at our next meeting of a hearing, at which time we will uh, take comments from the public in the town. The second item on our agenda this evening is the non-conforming lots zoning amendment. Um, request by the town council to consider an amendment to the zoning ordinance regulating the minimum lot size of non-conforming non lots, section 19-10-3 amendments. As a way of introduction, in May of 2000, the Town Council forwarded to the Planning Board an amendment that would make a non-conforming lot buildable. The Planning Board has analyzed the Town's non-conforming lots policy in eight workshop sessions and is considering the attached amendments to the zoning ordinance. The Planning Board is required to hold a public hearing before making recommendations to the Town's Council which is due April 1st. 
Is there any discussion regarding the amendments that have been put forward? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Carter. as all the board members know and many members of the public who have been actively involved in this, we have been discussing this for a number of months now. Uh, the next item before we submit it to the town council for their actions is to hold a public hearing. Uh, therefore, unless the majority of the board objects, I'd like to make a motion at this time to table it to our next meeting, at which time a public hearing will be held. A motion's been made. We hear a second. Second. Uh, motion's been made that we propose to have a public hearing at our next meeting on March 20th. Is there any discussion? And uh, shall we take a vote? All those in favor of the motion in front of us, please uh, show by raising your right hand. Uh, it's a unanimous carry of the vote. Uh, so at the March 20th meeting of the planning board, a public hearing will be held to uh, present uh, any thoughts that people may have on the issue of the new zoning ordinance as we submit it to the town council. That brings to a close uh, our agenda. Do I have any other comments? Or? Mr. Griffin? Mr. Carter. Uh, those who have been watching carefully through the evening have noticed that uh, Mr. Jack Roberts from the town council has been with us. I'd like to commend him for being here. A lot of you don't know that Jack makes a point of visiting every board operating under the umbrella of the town of Cape Elizabeth at least once a year. As chair of the nominating committee, I commend him for doing so. Uh, we'll all have the opportunity to corner him before he leaves the meeting tonight if you have any discussions you'd like to bring to the town council. And again, Jack, I thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, where well, this is my last meeting as chair, I'd like to thank the board for their support. Uh, it's been an easy job. I'm sure it will be for David and John. Uh, especially thanks to uh, Maureen, our town planner. Uh, when you have a planner like Maureen, all you have to do is show up. Uh, she keeps you well prepared and well informed and uh, makes you look good, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Cutter. Do you have a motion? Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Meeting adjourned. Did you second that?